Welcome to my first video from The Rose Garden, a series of biographical videos about women in history. Each video will feature the life story of a woman from history and a garment, item, or style from the relevant time period. For more information about this ongoing project, including a full list of women featured, you can visit lizcapism.com slash rosegarden. Billie Holiday, born Eleanor Fagan, was a pioneering jazz vocalist, known especially for the indelible mark she made on improvisational jazz and blues singing, becoming what might be called the first vocal instrumentalist. In her brief life, her work redefined the role of singers in jazz performances and the role of musicians in civil rights activism. The following passage, taken from the history of jazz by Ted Gioia, gives us to understand why many of the facts of her life need to be taken with a pinch of salt. Few of us get to choose our names, but Billie Holiday went further. She recrafted her life story in articles, interviews, and ultimately her autobiography. As later researchers have come to learn, these excursions into fantasy could take any number of directions. At times, Billie would make her life sound more sordid than it actually was. At other moments, she would give it an unwarranted varnish of respectability. There are some troubling details coming at various times in this video, and I will do my best to give you appropriate warnings when I can. Here are some brief facts about Billie Holiday that didn't manage to find a natural place in the video. Billie Holiday was married three times, and had other relationships with both men and women, including actress Tallulah Bankhead. In this video, the lack of details about her romantic or sexual relationships is due to the fact that almost all of her paramours could be described as some variety of no good. Without wishing to diminish their influence, I'd rather not give them too much limelight either. At various times in her life, she had a Staffordshire Terrier named Mr., and a Chihuahua named Peppy. She is reported to have loved dogs fiercely her whole life. Billie Holiday died only a few months after the establishment of the Grammy Awards, but has been honored with numerous posthumous Grammys, including Best Historical Album and a number of songs inducted into their Hall of Fame. My parents weren't particular fans of jazz, and so my first encounter with Billie Holiday came by way of a poetry class in university with the poem The Day Lady Died, which is a kind of eulogy to the singer. I quickly became entranced by the recordings that I discovered, and I have been a fan ever since. So what could I make to explore this woman's world? Well, let's quickly think about the world we're talking about. Without diving too deep into the vast history of jazz, we'll set the stage by explaining that the beginning of Billie Holiday's career started at a time when jazz was at a curious crossroads. It was, on the one hand, associated with speakeasies and the criminal organizations that ran them. Even after the repeal of Prohibition, these clubs continued to be seen as dens of moral turpitude. On the other hand, the musical virtuosity of these performers was beginning to be much more widely recognized, and the developing style of swing-era jazz made its way into upscale ballrooms, dance halls, and onto the radio. Jazz standards took on new styles, and old hits were refreshed with new recordings and a new audience to appreciate them. Many New York jazz clubs in the 30s through the 50s have also been noted as some of the most racially integrated places in all of the United States at the time. Jeff Gold published a book last year called Sittin' In, which uses photographs and first-hand account interviews to illustrate just how much of early segregation was broken down and defied in these establishments. On an unrelated but interesting note, the Mafia were some of the only proprietors for many years to pay a fair wage to black musicians in full and on time, according to the remembrances of Ethel Waters and other musicians. While I could go on, and certainly others have gone on, for another few hours about the adolescent years of jazz music, let's focus. The poem that introduced me to Billie Holiday was written by a man named Frank O'Hara. He and his fellow poets and artists were frequent patrons of jazz music, which was a substantial influence on their work. I felt that, given that this man brought me to the music of Ms. Holiday, it would be an apt choice for me to dress, as if I was accompanying Mr. O'Hara and his fellow poets to the Five Spot Cafe, the Village Vanguard, or Cafe Society, to look from a distance through the haze of history and cigarette smoke at Lady Day there on the stage. The dress code in New York jazz clubs seems to have been pretty lax, ranging from ultra-casual to very turned out, but regardless of the time period in question, the shirt dress seems to have always been a favorite for those close, hot, loud venues. I had two patterns, separated by 20 years, which would both fit the bill. But this one is closer to my size and won't need as much adjustment. Long sleeves or short sleeves? 
Short would seem ideal to keep cool in the sweltering atmosphere of a nightclub, but in my experience, once one tumbles into the open summer evening, one might require a tiny layer of precaution against an errant breeze. Long sleeves it is. We're coming up on a heat wave this week in Alberta. It's dry here, but New York would be muggy. How to accommodate my imagination and my practical reality? I think this plum-colored linen will suit perfectly. The shirt dress was originally called the shirtwaist dress, so-called because it was an extension of men's shirtwaists at the turn of the century. It's a classic, but provides ample opportunity to improvise, to develop some variations on a theme, to be as casual or dashingly formal as the setting requires. It has withstood the fluctuation of over a century of fashion trends and continues to be a staple wardrobe item for warm weather, a dress standard, if you will. So while I construct my take on a classic, Let's see about our leading Lady Day, who did the same with her voice for 20 years. On my way to the West End, and there's where troubles will begin. Let's lay the groundwork. These early times will develop a pattern that will guide us the rest of the way. No matter what you've started with, a lot of these early steps are very much the same. There are foundations that make our way clear at the start. Whether you learned these basics officially or unofficially, you learn how to feel them out. A mock-up is a good way to make sure that there aren't going to be any surprises that you aren't prepared for, and too bad there isn't a similar trial run for life. Billie Holiday was born in Philadelphia in 1915, and by November 1933, at the age of 18, she had made her recording debut. But by 18, she had already experienced more than anyone should ever have to in a lifetime. Her parents were not married, and their relationship ended soon after her birth. Her father, Clarence Halliday, was a jazz guitarist. Billy spent the next decade in the care of a rotating set of relations and friends of relations. None of these homes were permanent, safe, or stable. Her homes included single-room rentals, hotels, a brothel, a workhouse, and others. The first time she was brought before a judge was at the age of nine years old for truancy and lacking proper guardianship, which, while true, hardly seems the fault of a nine-year-old girl. She was sent to a Catholic reform school for nine months. By the next year, Holiday had dropped out of school entirely. On Christmas Eve, when she was 11 years old, she was the victim of either rape or attempted rape. Demonstrating a complete obtuse and abusive justice system, she was placed in protective custody as a state witness in the same reform school where two years earlier she had been placed as a punishment for truancy. As a side note, the act of placing vulnerable children in wards of the state in facilities that are also utilized as juvenile detention facilities is one that creates permanent disadvantages to this day, and it does continue to occur. At the beginning, things can feel very tedious. There's a lot of simple tasks, the equivalent of admin or grunt work, the kind of work you wish would fast forward just to get to the interesting parts. The picture isn't fully forming yet. Those puzzle pieces don't look anything like the Acropolis. I don't see how this dress will ever look presentable. Billie Holiday began her musical career performing in Harlem nightclubs, not an unusual step for the time and place. Her stage name was adopted from her favorite actress, Billy Dove, and her father's performing name, which was an adaptation of his surname Halliday. She landed a nightly gig in 1932 and her first recording session in 1933, at the age of 17. It was observed even at that early stage that she had an inbuilt sense of her own musical capabilities. She had fantastic creativity within those capabilities and learned early on how to oppose any suggestions that were outside of her ability. Billie Holiday never formally studied music, and more than one source has asserted that she couldn't read it either. But her talents were undeniable. Her approach to rhythm and phrasing in her vocals, as well as her consistent tweaking of the numbers she performed, gave the impression of her doing with her voice what other improvisational musicians did with their instruments. In a time when the vocal performances of jazz stayed relatively consistent compared to the instrumental solos, every performance of hers was unique and thrilling.
original pattern didn't have pockets, which we know is a crime of the first order, so I had to stop at this stage and crack open my reference material. Pockets, not unlike sleeves, tend to turn me inside out and backwards, but I forced myself to learn because I knew it would pay off. Over the next five years, Holiday built a career for herself with a combination of studio recordings and live performances. The sessions that she recorded and her live performances have been lovingly enumerated by Paolo Novaes on his website, BillyHolidaySongs.com. The ins and outs of the 1930s music industry skullduggery is enough to make anyone's head spin, and I am grateful to Mr. Novaes for doing this work so that I didn't have to. But instead of talking about all of the record companies, bands, performers, composers, and session musicians Ms. Holiday worked with during this time, I will mention her one and most important colleague, Lester Young, who played tenor saxophone. He gave her the nickname Lady Day, and she in turn nicknamed him Prez. From everything I have read of her life, Young may have been the only person in Holiday's life whose love or admiration didn't come attached to abuse or manipulation, and who acted always as a friend and not just for his own advantage. I didn't have so many, but I had a long, long way to go. Keep going, but try to go slow. This is an art after all. Setbacks will happen, but you know where you're going. Keep your head up, stay focused. There are times to follow instructions, and there are times to go your own way. It's not easy to know when to do which, and sometimes you just have to go with your gut. Holiday had a lot of firsts as a singer. When she worked as the vocalist for Artie Shaw's touring big band jazz ensemble, she was among the first black women to work with a white orchestra. With Shaw's band, she was also the first black female vocalist to tour full-time in the American South. Her experiences touring the South were troubling and frustrating. She was often asked to arrive via the kitchen, and she could not drink in the venue bars after shows with her bandmates. She was sometimes told not to appear on the bandstand with her white bandmates. But band leader Artie Shaw flatly refused those requests, insisting that she would perform on the bandstand because that is where she belonged. It is speculated that the incident that precipitated her leaving the band was the night when she was asked to use a service elevator. Despite these setbacks and frustrations, the late 30s were a time when Holiday's star was rising. Another special aspect of Billie Holiday's vocal stylings was the fact that she brought emotionality and a raw feeling to a lot of songs that had formerly been performed with detached upbeatness. There are songs that have become ballads because of her soulful and heartfelt renditions. This stylistic choice was a bold one, and paved the way for a particular song which would define her career, her life, and the civil rights movement. When you're unsure of what you're doing, especially if you decide to make a change, make sure you don't strike out alone. Don't reinvent the wheel. Chances are some people, or many people, have done a lot of work for you already. If you can find those people, it will go a long way to making those transitions and adjustments easier for you. Strange Fruit was originally a poem written by Abel Miropol, a Jewish teacher who was active in the civil rights movement. He later altered it to set it to music. While the story of how varies, it was brought to Billie Holiday's attention, and she made a studio recording and began performing it in her sets. The song describes lynched black bodies as strange fruit hanging from trees in the American South. Holiday resonated with the song in connection with the death of her father, whom she believed had died prematurely due to the Jim Crow laws and inherent racism that exists in the medical system. Holiday and her contemporaries were keenly aware of the fact that violent murder was not the only way that black people's lives were in danger from white majority society. For nine months, Holiday played almost nightly sets at Cafe Society. During that time, she and proprietor Barney Josephson laid out a routine that was observed while she sang Strange Fruit at the end of her nightly sets. The waiters ceased service, all the lights were turned off except for a spotlight, and there was no encore. Barney Josephson had opened Cafe Society with producer John Hammond with the deliberate intention to integrate every aspect of the organization, from backstage to audience to front of house and performers. 
and the deliberate reverence of strange fruit was consistent with his own values in the promotion of black lives and rights. This song, along with her rising success with other recordings, is really what cemented Billie Holiday as a mainstay of jazz performers then and now. The power of the song was recognized right away. The Federal Bureau of Narcotics opened up their investigations on Billie Holiday very shortly after she began performing Strange Fruit at Cafe Society. It's easy to tell yourself that you can clean up your mistakes afterwards, that you'll fix it later. The problem is that mistakes and accidents have a way of popping back up in ways you weren't expecting, and will make things harder and harder going forward. Hindsight is 2020, and it's silly to pretend we know what the consequences will be. And who can say whether it would have been better even if you had done everything right? Sometimes the pattern is bad, sometimes the instructions were wrong. It's hard to have faith in those things when you've been let down before, but you can't control anyone but yourself, and you can't do better than your best. Even though Billie Holiday was far more prolific in the 1930s and the 1950s, the 1940s were the most financially successful decade for Holiday. However, her success and fame during those years was marred, as is so often the case, with addiction, money-hungry family and friends, and domestic abuse. Her abuse of heroin and alcohol especially was a major contributor to mood swings, trouble with consistent working schedules, and generally declining health. The Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which was a newly branded department originally developed for the enforcement of prohibition, began targeting black musicians for drug-related crimes while actively interfering in court decisions to soften the punishments for white artists committing similar crimes. In a book exploring the history of the war on drugs, entitled Chasing the Scream, Johan Hari outlines ways that the Bureau targeted Billie Holiday's heroin use as retribution for their inability to stop her performing Strange Fruit, which they rightly considered to be a galvanizing point for civil rights protests and activism, which they were radically opposed to. The court proceedings following her arrest for narcotics possession, using Hari's book as the framework, is the basis for the 2020 film The United States vs. Billie Holiday. While the movie takes some liberties, as movies are wont to do, there is widespread agreement from most sides that Billie Holiday was especially subject to investigations which came eerily close to entrapment and resulted in numerous arrests over the years. Holiday was placed in a federal women's prison for drug-related felonies in May of 1947 and released in March 1948. This forced her to surrender her cabaret card, which was required to perform in New York establishments serving alcohol. You couldn't hold one if you were a convicted felon. The majority of Holiday's New York work after her release from prison was conducted either in music halls or theaters or in studio recordings, and she relied more than ever on national tours where she could still perform in nightclubs. Holiday observed correctly that many fellow musicians who had been brought up on similar charges for similar crimes were not punished as harshly and were often still allowed to play venues from which she was barred. She attributed this to her sex and her fame as well as her race. Brought to you by... This project would not have been possible without ongoing support of my Patreon patrons, whose support has allowed me to slow my schedule enough to make these research-heavy videos. They will be treated to a special bonus video, which is related to, but not directly about, Billie Holiday, the subject of today's video. If you would like to see more of these kinds of videos, as well as others about fashion and literary history, make sure to subscribe below. In the end, there is always temptation to overanalyze the results of a project, to list all of the woulda, coulda, shouldas. There is a desperate need to explain away everything that went wrong and why. Maybe all your reasoning is right. Maybe everything that you say is true. That doesn't make this impulse constructive, unless you intend to learn something and apply it going forward. The action of going over every little stitch to tell yourself where you went wrong usually does more harm than good. If you are able to reflect in a collected way about some things you would do next time to improve the outcome, then by all means go ahead. But take a moment or two, after it's over, just to sit with it the way that it is. Because it is what it is, and there is no changing that. There is power and grace in that feeling. That 
wholehearted, radical acceptance is an act of tremendous courage. It is. You are. This is yours. You made it. Nothing here is wrong if you put your love and heart into it. You are human, after all. Billie Holiday began to deteriorate significantly in the mid-1950s, the result of nearly two decades of drugs, alcohol, physical, and emotional abuse. Her voice had altered, and her performances were noticeably different. At this time, many of her records were already out of print, and even those that weren't didn't pay her much or anything in the way of royalties. She made several attempts at a comeback in these years, including a television special, a European tour, and the publication of a ghost-written autobiography. The autobiography was a calculated public relations choice, and therefore redacted a great deal of the artist's early life and relationships. It was further altered when a significant number of people mentioned in the book raised objections, threatening to bring libel suits against her. Orson Welles, a one-time paramour, is the only person noted to have had no objections. The public response to these attempts at a comeback was generally positive. She played two sold-out concerts at Carnegie Hall and made additional appearances in Europe. She recorded over 100 more studio tracks and an amazing 162 live tracks, more than twice the live recordings she had made during the 30s and 40s combined. Despite her attempts to regain her health and maintain sobriety, Holiday relapsed several times in the next few years. She was finally hospitalized in 1959 and diagnosed with cirrhosis of the liver. Her admission to the hospital only occurred after repeated pleading from her manager and close friends, who had seen her rapid weight loss and her health worsening for months. True to the character of the agency, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics raided her hospital room, arresting her and putting her in handcuffs. After those despicable gestures of hostility, she was placed under armed guard. Police stood beside what was effectively her deathbed for several weeks. They were not removed until a few hours before her death on July 17th. Before we do our final reveal, let me just thank you for watching. Biographies are hard to write. There's so much left unsaid, or that isn't known, or that doesn't fit. Every edit I made while writing this video made me feel like I was misleading or deceiving you. Trust me when I say that I did my best. If you're interested in learning more about Billie Holiday, I will list my most significant sources in the description below. I'm also listing the donation pages of several nonprofit organizations who help and advocate for victims of substance abuse, including rehabilitation, education, transitional support, and the promotion of safe and supervised consumption sites. Please consider donating if you are able to do so. With no more ado, let us take our seats. as our special guest, she's the great Lady Day, Billie Holiday. It costs me a lot, but there's one thing that I've got, it's my man. It's my man Cold or wet Tied your bed All of this I'll soon forget With my man He's not much on looks he is no hero out of books, but I love him, yes, I love him, oh, my man, I love him so, he'll never know. My life is just despair, but I don't care when he takes me in his arms. The world is bright, all right. What's the difference if I say? 
go away when I know I've come back home. I need some Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.